Hello, thanks so much for coming, guys. Um, welcome to our meetup, the Frontend Developers United, here hosted by LinkedIn. Um, tonight, uh, we are going to be hearing from uh, Vina from LinkedIn and Jeff from PayPal on their use of Dust.js. Should be a very exciting talk. My name is Seth McLaughlin. I work here at LinkedIn, and I'm the organizer of this meetup. And uh, we try to meet every month around the 28th, the end of the month. So if you haven't already, please join our meetup. Sign up on meetup.com. And I'll let Vina take it from here. Hey, guys. Um, again, I sincerely apologize for the lack of food. I know how all uh, talks go. You come here for free food and free t-shirts. <laughs> Hopefully, some of you got the free t-shirts. Um, and. Um, uh, and hope you like it. So um, I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm Vina. Um, I work. I've been working in LinkedIn almost um, close to um, three years, I think, in May. Uh, so it's been a long time working in a company that's grown, you know, hugely in the last one and a half years. Um, and this talk is mostly uh, focused on some of our learnings. So I hope this doesn't. Uh, it's not like a you know 101 on how we built using Dust, because we did come up with some of those uh, talks um, uh, earlier. Um, but most of this uh, talk is focused on how we use Dust. Um, and there was a blog post we uh, did um, quite a while ago. It was uh, late in uh, December um, uh, of uh, 2011. We did a blog post on why we wanted to use Dust, why we wanted to use uh, client-side templating language such as Dust. Um, we also followed up with a blog post on uh, many people came back to us and, and said, uh, why did you use Dust? Because Dust was something that was not very popular at the point of time. Uh, many um, uh, companies had uh, used a templating language called Mustache. So how many here have even heard of Mustache? Yeah, great. I'm, I'm excited. Even, even without the food, you guys are like raising hands. <laughs> so uh, that was one of the very popular ones out there. And then uh, uh, there was a huge growth of these uh, templating languages in the, in the, in, in the uh, JS world. And uh, we, we, when we started looking at them, um, uh, we wanted to use um, uh, one of them for uh, reasons I'm going to explain. And we chose Dust. So we followed up with the blog post. And then we kind of kept quiet. Um, we didn't say much about it. And uh, um, many times, people have written to me, because I was like one of the auth authors of this blog post, is, uh, are you guys still using Dust? Um, or is was just a like a blog post you did <laughs> to to grab attention. Um, sadly, uh, we didn't do more blog posts, and we uh, want to continue to do this. And I'll explain why and what are the you know the reasons we've been busy with last year. Um, again, um, there's a lot of other people in my company working along with me. Um, just because I write the blog post doesn't mean I pretty much <laughs> know everything. Uh, these are all their GitHub accounts. Uh, I'll explain why I put it in the GitHub, because we maintain um, a Dust, again, as open source. So if you are on the GitHub, uh, if you are an active uh, contributor, please you know, check this out on our um, um, linkedin.com slash GitHub. Uh, we have a lot of projects that we open source, and Dust is one of them. Um, so this is the question, right? I mean, I, was, I preluded to it. Are we actually using Dust for our application? And, 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 and the simple answer, and, 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 and the simple answer is, oh, yes. Uh, we use it for a um, lot of our uh, internal applications, a lot of our uh, external consumer side that we have here at LinkedIn. Um, and and, and, and I'll, I'll talk through them. So it's been a party, I say, because last, since last year, when we started um, uh, adopting uh, um, uh, these new technologies, I think our company also had this very, uh, you know, uh, gr I mean, a viral growth and like hiring a lot of people. Uh, we had a great lo lot of product ideas we wanted to build on. And, and you know, some hint to that is, I don't know how many people recognize this symbol. Our company has been like really doing well, right? That's the party I'm talking of. Um, and the, the goal for us working in an infrastructure team that kind of helps build front ends was to help uh, different teams but a lot of these product ideas, because we want to experiment more. Uh, we want to roll out things more, learn from how those products are received. And it's, it's all about iterating faster. And, and our existing technologies that we were using were not allowing us to do that. And one of that technology that uh, you know, helps us do that is with, is with Dust. So that's the real party. But was it all easy, right? Um, and, and then how many people here come from companies 
um, that use um, server-side uh, technologies like JSPs. Right? I mean, I know I've been working closely with PayPal, um, and a lot of companies are built with um, Tomcat uh, apps, uh, Ruby on Rails, a lot of them, Django, right? I mean, all of these, at the end of the day, use server-side templating languages. They, um, they don't have this notion of client template. And for some cases, it's not even probably relevant. Uh, but for us uh, at LinkedIn, uh, we had a different reason, as I alluded in the blog post that I wrote. Uh, we have a lot of uh, front-end technologies. We do have um, Java. We have uh, some applications built on Grails. Um, some applications are built on, um, I think they're almost dead. <laughs> they were built on Ruby and Rails. Um, and, and, and a lot of our mobile applications today are now built on Node.js. Um, and there were other in-house uh, frameworks that we ended up using on Tomcat. Um, and one of the goal was how do we um, uh, let them use the same frameworks that you're using, but still unify um, uh, one layer, that was the, the, the view layer. Uh, and we chose to do that with uh, Dust.js. So it was, again, you know, you build a lot of these new technologies, and, 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 I, and, and I allude to saying it, it's not easy. When you, when you build a prototype, it's easy. Uh, you roll it out to a few people, it's easy. But you end up uh, asking the entire company to adopt these new technologies, it's not very easy. One of the other questions when you adopt a new thing that you have to ask for is like, is there a good community around it, right? I mean, the reason why you want to go open source, uh, the reason why you want to actually use something that's already built. Um, and, and, and one of the learnings from, uh, from the last one year that we have, uh, have spent on LinkedIn is, uh, if there is something already good out there, don't try to reinvent the same thing. Just use it, make it better, right? Contribute to an existing project. It really helps you learn a lot as well as you know help others a lot. So we had 20, we evaluated 21 different uh, templating languages, and we closely evaluated four of them. Um, some of them obviously worked well for us, some of them didn't, uh, but none of them were like perfect. Um, but we chose one of them, and we said that we're going to improve on it. So Dust is uh, one of them. Uh, it was not uh, good in the beginning, but right now it's not bad. And one of our um, sir, uh, uh, supporters is um, PayPal. Um, that's one of the biggest companies using it. And they're here, and Jeff is going to talk about it later. Um, and uh, we, we, we started collaborating with them. We've learned quite a bit about you know, how, what are their use cases and stuff. And we have contributed quite a bit uh, to it as well. Another interesting question that I almost, almost get asked every time you know, on an email. You know, somebody emails and asks me, and somebody just pings me on the Twitter and says, um, uh, why did you guys uh, have your own fork of LinkedIn? Um, so if, 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 do people know about it, that we have a GitHub project, but we actually have our own fork? We don't contribute to the main uh, 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 the, the repo that uh, was there. Um, I think it's a simple answer. I don't know many people know that. Uh, we don't know what the story is, but the original author who wrote such a you know, good templating language is not responsive. Uh, so that's the only reason we have our own fork, um, and we have tried to uh, maintain it. Any day he comes back, <laughs> we're happy to merge it with his uh, main repo, as long as we convince him. Um, so that's the only reason we have a fork, and, and, and seriously, it's not any evil intention of any kind of world domination, okay? We really don't want to say LinkedIn does everything great. So that's the only reason we have a fork, and uh, hopefully that answers. So this is our, we, we have um, ended up, um, you know, creating our own uh, version of things. We have done a lot of announcements. Um, you can go um, check that out on linkedin.com um, slash dustjs. Um, we do a lot of releases. Uh, the reason why we've been, um, um, you know, again, not too um, noisy about uh, saying is, is because I think we wanted to eat our own dog food kind of uh, mentality. So we've used the whole uh, last of one year to kind of experiment on different kinds of products that we're building to use Dust. And as we started building, we encountered a lot of challenges. Um, so how many people here know that Dust is a, like a logicless template and, and what does that mean? Um, there are a few ones that went up, but I know PayPal guys know it. Know it. So the concept of Dust means unlike any other templating language, how many people here have used uh, Rubies, ERBs, and, and JSPs. I think a few hands will go up. Um, with the ERBs and JSPs, you have a lot of uh, support for doing you know, uh, any kind of logic there. Uh, but Dust or Mustache um, or another equivalent is Handlebars limits you and lets you say that this templating language is just for getting data, I mean, just rendering data. It doesn't give you a lot of constructs inherent to do all of this uh, rendering. So we ended up kind of thinking through this problem. And we have our own version of it that, um, you know, uh, as uh, extended. 
And uh, this is the, these are the links of you know things like you know, parts of the things like you know documentation that were kind of missing from the original repo. Um, Rich from you know PayPal has written this excellent uh, documentation because. For a lot of lot of the stuff that we do uh, in at, at LinkedIn, everything was in house, and and a lot of the knowledge was in house. So with DOS, it helps us kind of even put up simple things on how you build a small module, how you do a certain thing this way out out there, and build like small snippets of code that people can look at and learn from. So going open source has really helped us do that. Uh, for good or bad, this is our LinkedIn owns a lot of like open source project, and DOS is one of them, um, and. For good or bad, there are a lot of people who have uh, forked it, have uh, like experimented with it. We have a lot of downloads. Um, and how many people here have used Node.js on and off? OK, so um, uh, beauty of Dust is it works with Node seamlessly. Um, and you, know, you can start using it. Like, it's like a five minute uh, um, a thing for you to start using uh, Dust with Node. So, I've seen a lot of people using Dust with Node, and, and there's been a great traffic um, in downloading our version of uh, Dust.js and using it. So we forked it. We started using, I know we call it dusting here, and, and that's the t-shirt thing. <laughs> we do a lot of that. I mean, a of, lot, lot of our apps have been built using it. But as I say, one of the challenges is we realize we need a lot of like, logic to be done, and we kind of chose Dust, which is logicless. What do we do? Um, one way we could have just dropped it and gone back. But I think there were a lot of good things with Dust, as I said. Uh, one thing, it keeps your UI really clean because you can't really do too much. You've seen a lot of our code base that kind of puts so much logic in these templates, which is really not necessary when you look at. So we said, let's keep our product you know, UI design clean and do things more cleanly. And we have been very successful. And in, in, in some of the pages that I'm going to show later are examples of we built, it looks complex, but underneath it's still using Dust. And it's pretty neat and clean. But some things, there are some things that you have to still do um, on, the on the client. And people here who work with um, you know, styling and behavior and JS uh, on the templates know that there is a very little uh, uh, um, a part of the, the, the template that's static today. And a lot of the template that you render is very dynamic. So you need some kind of helper. So we have uh, built. A few helpers. Again, it's open source. I, I didn't want to, uh, you know, uh, get into code samples and how these used. I can talk about it. Um, simple things that we have seen is uh, when you um, use um, uh, Dust, all it works with is JSON. That means it's a templating language. You have placeholders uh, that um, it has, and those placeholders, if they are in the JSON, they get rendered. But most of the time, you want to do some simple rendering logic, right? If the column um, or the row is even or odd, you want to paint it with a certain CSS class or things like that. These are very trivial examples. And if you don't have constructs in a templating language to do those things, um, it's, it's really, really uh, you know, limiting. Um, and you end up writing really ugly code on the server. So now you moved all your ugliness that were on the JSPs or on your templating to the, actually the server. But that was not our goal either. Uh, there are many cases in, in LinkedIn where a lot of the modules look very alike. Like there's the same module that kind of repeats across different pages. So we want to reuse some of that. Um, and, and things like that are easy with, uh, with, with any kind of helpers you could write. So we have, uh, and these helpers are basically written in JavaScript. Uh, one thing that people may not know, Dust is a templating language, but what gets served um, is really a JavaScript um, on the browser. So Dust gets compiled to uh, JavaScript when it's served. Um, Dust, that's the same with uh, uh, any kind of other templating language like Handlebars too. Uh, so these helpers are again all in JavaScript. So that was the beauty of it. So we have a lot of developers who are very skilled in JavaScript here, who do a lot of the front end stuff. Uh, for them, understanding this templating language was probably dead easy. Another interesting side effect of using um, uh, a templating language is Dust is it purely works with JSON, right? And JSON is a very standard protocol. Um, so people are able to mock things up uh, using some mock JSON data and write a Dust template and build prototypes. Um, and I know PayPal has a heavy use case uh, that they have built their whole UI team around it. So that's pretty much in LinkedIn too. It kind of allows people to use mock data and templates and, 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 and iterate faster. Um, they don't rely on server-side technologies. But this was another challenge for us. And, and LinkedIn, if you know, is heavily um, you know, built using Java stack. And we continue to be a Java uh, shop for a lot of uh, reasons. Uh, one of the reasons being, you know, it's easy to scale with Java. Um, again, it's very proven and mature. Um, 
Third, it's really easy to hire a lot of people uh, because getting developers who know uh, newer technologies like you know using Node or probably using Scala and things is harder. But I think getting people who can do Java is not that hard. And sometimes you know it's it's an easy choice to get a person who knows Java and then um, you know uh, move them to doing Scala and things like that. So we've kept our stack still Java, and most people ask that just because. You're using, you know, JS and client side stuff. How does your backend stack look like? Our backend stack hasn't changed much. Um, the only thing that has changed is we expect JSON from different uh, services at this point of time, and uh, we try to do um, uh, everything on the on the client. So most of the things are rendered on the client with template. But the biggest challenge, as I said, is how many people here understand that UI development is all about A/B testing? Do, do do people know that? I mean, that's what I've realized working here at LinkedIn um, because. <laughs> it's, it's all about rolling out things uh, to a certain you know, bunch of people and, and then able to you know, get feedback. You, know, you run a lot of tests, uh, you, you get feedback, and then you, know, that, then you can walk up to your product manager and, and, and kind of say, you know, this, is, this is how it was used. So with client templates like you know, Dust, where every single helper needs to be on the client, it's really hard uh, to kind of uh, do these things on the client. So um, people confuse uh, client and JavaScript quite a bit. So when I say, um, uh, I mean, J JavaScript is, is, is a universal language. It's, it's used in the browser, but it's not just in the browser. You can actually run JavaScript on the server. And how many people have heard of Ni Rhino here? They have. And then how many people have heard of the, uh, the V8 engine, which is another uh, JavaScript engine that can be run on the server? So all of these allow you to actually run a lot of these helpers, not just on the, on the browser, but also on the server, but they are JavaScript. So for some of the complex things, right? I mean, you want to do some kind of Lix uh, logic. Lix is an equivalent. Uh, I should explain it. It's, a, it's an equivalent that we use here for um, LI experiments. Uh, LI is for LinkedIn, and X is the experiments. Uh, and we do a lot of A/B testing on our UI. And um, we have to have some kind of helpers for someone to say, you know, if the person or the member, um, you know, uh, looking at this particular module in a geographical region X uh, in the range, uh, you know, Y has to sh see this module or not see this module. So this, the, this kind of logic can really not be pushed to the browser, right? Because it has complex logic on how we determine that. Sometimes it's a secret sauce. Like a lot of our uh, formatting is pretty much a secret sauce. So we can't push these stuff onto the, onto the, onto the, in a browser. Um, so alternative for that is you can actually write these helpers in uh, JavaScript and run them on the server using um, uh, something like Rhino or something like you know, V8. That's one way of doing it. But here at LinkedIn, um, you know, we have a lot of these libraries that are written in Java as well. So one of the challenges was how do we migrate all of this to JavaScript? So these are like real problems when you try to roll it out to a company as big as, the, as a set of developers, you know. Uh, you think about migration path, you think about code maintainability, you, you think about, um, you know, how do you um, maintain sync with different code bases that are doing the same thing. So all of that is, was a challenge. Um, it's been a year and we've been thinking through. Um, we rolled out some um, version of our solution early last year, and now we are like thinking of slowly migrating uh, some of these libraries that we had to JavaScript. So, because we have good evidence that using Rhino or using V8 is good enough, we still have our pages using them, and our our, our metrics are pretty uh, strong. Um, on, I mean, the site speed metrics, our engagement metrics of using this are pretty strong. So, I think we waited for long. So, what is the takeaway from this? Is you really don't have to jump into doing everything one way just because you adopted a new technology. You can take it slow. Um, it's okay if you spend two years before you figure out the full solution. It's okay, you know, if you get it wrong the first time. So I think our, our lesson or our challenge has been um, how do we incrementally uh, uh, move towards a pure JavaScript solution if it can be. So some of the libraries still couldn't. So we ended up building our own, you know, it's called Dustly. Uh, it's, it's, it's like a RESTful service for kind of, um, I don't know, it was open source. RESTly is our uh, uh, you know, infrastructure we built for generating RESTful services. So some of this data like um, uh, URL generation and stuff that cannot be pushed back um, onto, the, onto the browser, we uh, uh, written helpers that do get uh, um, run on, on the server. And it's, it's still kind of not tied to uh, JVM or it's not tied to a Java thing. It's, it's JSON and a JSON out. So we have mobile applications that could be written in, um, in Node, but if they want to use our uh, services for generating URLs or generating licks, um, they basically talk to this RESTful service. And we kind of have, I mean, we don't treat 
um, this, this presentation data any more any differently than our, our normal data we serve. Like we have combined both of them in a, in a similar way. So this is something we've built. We made it very generic, and we're going to open source that. And it could be plugged, with, plugged in with any template. It doesn't have to be dust template. And uh, that the, the whole goal is that you've uh, um, uh, uh, separated your uh, uh, template and your, and, and your uh, data. So to recap, these helpers are similar to the equals and the select and all the kinds of helpers you can write in dust. It's just that they run on the server. Um, if implemented in JavaScript, you can run them in um, on, on, on using Rhino. If not, you could actually uh, use a service to kind of generate decorated data. So still with using these newer technologies, our goal was not to uh, you know, make anything worse than what we had in JSPs or, or, or with server-side templating. People at LinkedIn do care a lot about how the code is structured, uh, how you write code, because we care about maintainability, right? Um, you, may, you may be working in a team for a couple of months, and then you move around to working on something else. So whatever we write, we really care about how good it is to maintain and how good it is to scale um, as well. So some of the solutions we have um, have been good, but some of the solutions not very intuitive because I can see um, in, in this one slide when I talk about these helpers being run on the server, I don't know how many people really got it. Uh, it takes, uh, um, you know, it's not as intuitive as, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking here. So we have learned from it, and, and we have also learned that not all applications can benefit from using one thing. So some applications basically write all of this code in their controller. So we are trying to use uh, Play. I don't know how many people have used uh, Play. It's another MVC application that's built on Netty. Uh, that's, uh, it's a very, uh, it's like basically Ruby on Rails in Java. Uh, much, much uh, stable, I guess. Uh, you can scale it. So w when, when you're using uh, something like Play, probably it's easier uh, to let you do a lot of the, you know, the, the formatting and the decoration that you want to do for the data right in your Play controllers. Uh, so that's our answer in, in many ways. So we don't have, and we have learned that there is no one uh, size fits all solution when you try to use uh, these different technologies. Certain uh, applications uh, uh, fit, uh, fit in one and certain don't. Another important uh, drastically, uh, you know, uh, uh, drastic change that's happened um, in our um, in our LinkedIn is, as I said, when we started telling people to use these uh, logicless templates, everybody's like, "No way, I cannot." I mean, there's so much stuff I need to do on the client. You know, there's no way this just template can allow me to do all this. But slowly, they've realized that if there is something really complex, they can move it to the server. It's not as hard as you think sometimes. You think about it, you internalize it, and you simplify it, and actually you're really happy about it in the end. So I, 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 I think one of the takeaways from the learnings the last year I've done is 80% of her cases are very simple. They don't need a lot of these complex logics. So um, it, it helps you uh, refine your product, it helps you refine the, you know, the payload, and it helps you actually build things that are more reusable. So that's another lesson we've learned using Dust, which is again a side effect, uh, may not be applicable to everybody, but you know, for us certainly it has. So before, you know, I, I, and I want to answer a few more questions. So most people have this asked this question again and again. Um, how, I mean, most companies run these SEO pages, right? Uh, and these SEO pages, basically bots, they don't understand JavaScript. And, and what happens to those kind of pages? Because SEO is important for your, you know, your page ranking and things like that. And emails. And how many people here know that LinkedIn sends a lot of emails? <laughs> so LinkedIn is, uh, it does a lot of that, and, 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 and emails is like a huge thing for LinkedIn, right? Again, we did not want to have a different technology for emails. All our email templates today are again written in Dust. Um, it's just that emails don't have a browser. Everybody knows that. Emails have to be rendered on the server. So these are the two important use cases we've addressed in the past few months, uh, wherein certain use cases cannot render on the client. That means on the browser. They have to be rendered on the server. You might think then really, like, what do you do? Like, you know, you now have adopted all this client templating, client rendering technologies that work only in the browser. Um, do you think, you know, you can still keep it uh, going? Because there is a strong need in this case to render on the server. And as I said, there are answers to it, and we initially were skeptical that you know, it wouldn't scale, it wouldn't work, but actually it wasn't as hard as solving all the IETN and the licks and the formatting that we talked about because we have huge uh, infrastructure built in Java and the move to JavaScript was harder. But this was like the easiest part, I think, to solve. Um, we render all of these JS templates on the server in those cases. Um, there is a proxy that sits in front of our web applications that determines you know, in a way if it's a IE8 or IE7, which is slow, 
it automatically switches to rendering on the server. Um, there can be certain configurations you can put in control tags when you say um, that this particular module uh, can be just rendered on the server. So it's a very configurable thing. Um, there are certain applications written that um, cannot be rendered on the client for security reasons, right? So we say in those cases you can configure to render on the server. The beauty again, most people uh, may walk out of it thinking that is there anything different that the web developer or the front end engineer has to do? Exactly, no. Um, because the template you write just stays the same. It's just the, the rendering happens on a server side in a JavaScript engine. And for Rhino is one of them. We use that for emails. Um, We've, we've done load tests and, and it's a great, it gives you, you know, sufficient throughput for what you need. I mean, if LinkedIn is a big company and if it's spamming you with so many emails and it can actually render with Rhino, I think it's a good enough testament that it's not bad. And then uh, V8 is another uh, JavaScript engine, which is actually way more faster and way more stable, I guess, say. Um, I mean, because a lot of active development going on as well, so we, uh, we chose it. Um, we use that for uh, the web cases because we really believe in site speed. A lot of our revenue, a lot of our LinkedIn stock is <laughs> betted on uh, how much engagement we drive, and we really can't have pages that are really slow. So uh, we betted on uh, using V8 for the web. So either of these were not uh, easy. We're ramping both for a lot of our applications, and, 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 and it's been good. So who, who are you really using in LinkedIn? I don't know how many people here have LinkedIn profiles. I'm pretty sure you have, and I don't know how many people regularly use it. Uh, last year, we did a big revamp of the new profile, and I, I put up <laughs> Bill's name in here, um, and, and that's, that's our link, new LinkedIn profile. Um, all of this is built in Dust. Uh, you can go look at the page source and, and look at it. It's using Dust. It's basically serving via JSON. Um, and, and it was easy to do some of our age axi like interaction. So the inline editing of the profile, which is, again, a major source of um, um, uh, um, engagement driver for us because a lot of the profiles before last year were very lean. Like, you know, you had no data. You just had your name and your thing. But we want you to fill your courses, your projects. And that's where we do a lot of data mining on. And that's where we can actually get intelligent and, you know, make more money. So the inline editing wasn't a feature. If you'd seen old um, LinkedIn site, it was like you have to go through three different pages to edit your name, uh, three different pages to actually edit your score. A lot of these inline editing and more cool features are easy to do with client-side rendering because... You know, it, it gives you the flexibility of using JSON and render. And by the way, our engagement metrics after we rolled out profile has been, you know, very, very good. So that's been a testament that we're going to continue using. Uh, again, for some of the browsers like IE7, the, the answer has been very dismal, right? Very disappointing because IE7 and IE8 are not good at JSON parsing. They're not good at, you know, rendering. So for those things, as I said, we switched to use, uh, you know, server-side rendering. The new search pages we just went uh, in a release last week. This is our unified search page. This is again one of our, as I say, it's one of our top three pages, profile being one of them. This is a search page um, that was completely rebuilt with Dust. Um, and you know, you'll get that rollout very soon. Um, we, people mostly ask us questions. So search, do you think you can use Dust? Um, we have, and I, I think this whole search page uh, is being uh, uh, completely uh, revamped to use Dust. I don't know. I should ask Rich. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then there is the influencers. So there is another example. I don't know how many people. I'm trying to do a little bit of PR of our products here. Um, again, this is a new product that we launched last year. Uh, kind of uh, people do cool blog posts, and there are like leaders and thought leaders in certain uh, areas. Um, we have a lot of them uh, uh, contributing to this, and this is still uh, using Dust. So yeah, that's my last slide. We use a lot of JSON and a lot of Dust. Um, we have learned from a lot of lessons, um, and if you uh, ask me three takeaways from this uh, meeting before I uh, give it up to Jeff, um, I think is uh, uh, don't be hesitant of using our new technologies, um, and don't be so optimistic in the beginning that everything should use it. Uh, take it slow, take your time, um, and you will discover. Second thing what I've learned is um, when you begin with, you don't really know what the benefits of moving to that are, 100%. As you go through it, you learn with your group of people. You discover more uh, you know, uh, um, things that you did not set out for. And, 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 and lastly, I think one big thing that, again, I traded a lot is um, keep it open. Um, even if it's like not the greatest solution anybody will adopt, Making it open source and keeping it open makes you a better developer and a better a contributor to your company. So 
do anything with uh, these newer technologies, try to make it really open. And that's my last point here. All right. All right, questions, or we wanna go with Jeff and then switch over. Uh, so we can definitely take questions, but please step up to the mic um, so that they will be captured. Thank you. Hi, um, <clears throat> I'm working for a startup. I'll try to evaluating what, uh, you know, I want client, to speak to the mic. Sorry, uh, client side uh, frame, uh, frameworks. So we we saw the, your post and we liked uh, that's dot uh, yes. Uh, so we have uh, several questions related to it. So one is, uh, <clears throat> so you you mentioned about SEO and so I didn't quite get it how you know how that play and then the uh, how you know how it worked and the other part is uh, do you use this for mobile application? Do you see it performance degradations for it? And you also mentioned that you're using Play framework, and Play is really a server-side rendering. So how that play with this? Uh, uh, you also mentioned about a V8 rendering, and uh, how that worked together with a dozen. So maybe just a few okay, more. My memory isn't that great. Uh, so I might go backwards. <laughs> so the first thing is uh, you mentioned about us using Play framework, right? Right. Um, so Play framework is a server-side MVC, yes. uh, and it runs on Netty. Um, it doesn't use Tomcat. But the templating language is very pluggable. So it comes with Scala templates, but we chose not to use Scala templates. So the MVC, the V part, is still dust for us. And a lot of the pages that are built using Play since the beginning of this year uh, use dust for views. They don't use uh, uh, the Scala templates. Again, for the same benefits, right? With dust, you can CD and cache these templates. Uh, you can uh, choose to render them on the client on the server. Um, instead of you spending CPU power to render these templates, you can use the distributed browser to actually render it for you, uh, right? I mean, you, you, you have those benefits, and, and, and that's, that's the, uh, uh, that, that probably answers your question about uh, Play and Dust are orthogonal to us. Uh, Play is a, a framework that we chose because it's really evolving, um, and, and we want to invest a lot of uh, our, our people into learning it. Um, it's, it's really you know, fa good for fast development because it's like Ruby on Rails but on Java, but we are a Java shop, um, we have a lot of libraries in, in built in Java, as I said. Um, so we didn't want to reinvest in writing that in JavaScript or something. Like we could have gone Node too, but we've used uh, a Play for that. And uh, it, as I said, it's totally pluggable, so we use Dust. Um, your second question was about, I mean, go backwards, it's about okay. mobile. So the other, uh, yeah, mobile okay. is a very interesting question. Uh, so the way LinkedIn uh, predominantly is was a desktop website, and uh, we focused heavily on desktop until uh, early, uh, you know, to, uh, a couple of years back. And um, mobile today uses Node, and um, and they uh, were mobile web uh, most of the time. I mean, until until early this year. So one of the move towards, I mean, LinkedIn is going towards is going more native. So when you go native, really, I mean, the, the templating language becomes a moot point. I mean, you're not using any template to render it. It's end of the day Objective C and iPhone or you know Android and th has its own language. So. Um, maybe, the, I mean, if someone convinces us to move back to <laughs> mobile web, we would use Dust, but you know, we never ended up using Dust there. Performance and reason, I don't, because PayPal can be a testament to that, uh, because Dust has been super fast in, in rendering. Um, and I tell you frankly, mobile is a good use case, because on web, we have i7 and i6 sometimes you have to support, and we are a company that we have to support these kinds of things. Uh, so the performance is wide varying for web. For mobile, you are all on iOS, and you have a more consistent, uh, uh, you know, uh, metrics that you could uh, rely on. And the first one, I think, memory is not good. So, what was so the other one, it was uh, actually it's about V8 rendering. How do you use that? And okay. actually, I have a different question. I forgot to ask. Is uh, you uh, Dasa is a templating engine. So, uh, what do you use for MVC on the client side? That's a great question. So, I think uh, we use Backbone. Backbone has been something the mobile team started using in our company, and again, not a lot of it has been built using Backbone, but that's been standardized. Um, again, it's, it's a learning curve for a lot of people, right? I mean, we don't push it on some developer and say, you have to ship this product with Backbone. Uh, we again don't push it on a product team and say, oh, you have to use Dust to ship this product. Um, so I think it's a slow uh, adoption, and Backbone is the same reasons. I think I, I share the same uh, goals as you know, the company shares. We really didn't want to build anything of our own just for an MVC. I, I, and I know that there are like hundreds of MVC out there. I mean, every name possible, at every letter probably, you can have a MVC framework. But we, I think, choose Backbone is pretty good. And uh, we don't use a full version as I've heard. I'm, 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 I'm not an expert at it here. Um, we have used a trimmed down version of it for, uh, for our web cases as well. So it's the Backbone, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. 
He probably asked all the questions that everybody had in mind. <laughs> um, I think we'll um, let Jeff do the talk now and, and probably get back to questions in the end. If you guys still have energy or probably food shows up or something like that. Okay. Thank you, guys. He's behind it. I guess I know my mic's on when I clap and I can hear it. Hey guys, I'm Jeff Harrell. I'm the, I lead the UAE architecture team at PayPal. Um, we're going to talk about Dust as well, put a slightly different spin on it. Uh, but I did actually want to call out one comment you had at the very end, which I liked, which was, it's interesting when you pick up a new technology and you run with it, and then uh, I think problems you solve or, or you know, ideas that come up along the way that you never even were looking for, and you find them. And so it's really neat, and that's part of what, what I want to talk to you guys about today. So. Um, Recently, I think roughly about a year ago, PayPal adopted uh, the idea of JavaScript uh, templating. And the idea was really threefold. We wanted, uh, the primary one was we wanted to increase the design iteration speed we have. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we really wanted to get to a point where we were really innovating on design and really driving home uh, and nailing the design before we actually ship it and give it out to the customers. Um, we wanted to separate the concerns between the UI and the application. We really wanted to be able to evolve <clears throat> either independently and not have to carry home a lot of baggage. And I have more details on that as well. Uh, and then, you know, in light of that, we also wanted to really bridge the technology gaps we have. Uh, PayPal has a long history of development. We have 10 plus years of technology stacks that we need to account for. <clears throat> and so we wanted to make sure that we can solve for that as well. And I think that was part of the interesting thing that we're starting to see out of it. Um, so on the note of uh, increasing the speed of iter design iterations, you know, we really wanted to get to the point where really quickly we could build out a concept and test it and you know, try it on users, find out what it meant. We didn't want, uh, there's a time and a place when you're doing design iterations for doing paper mockups or for upping the par and doing you know, image mockups, et cetera. We, in our case, uh, you know, we're a little bit, we, we would do that as well, but this part of the process where we inject ourselves we want to be actually testing you know, real code on users. Uh, there's a point where you know, low fidelity things uh, on the code standpoint, they're not quite as real as what you would really see in real, uh, real life. So when you test it, it may test great. And then in reality, something's lost in translation and it's not quite there. Uh, and then throughout that process, we want to be, again, real quick on iteration so that we can rinse and repeat. Um, and so <clears throat> this is really what our model looks like. Do you like my drawings? Um, you know, we'll draw, we would ultimately, at this point, we're at a mode where we'll dry out something really lightweight. So you'll get the, uh, you know, the sketch on a whiteboard, sketch on a napkin, whatever have you. You know, that'll get iterated over, that'll get turned into code, and then that'll get shown to users. And uh, that code will ultimately be the dust code. Uh, and so we'll get feedback from the users, we'll bring it back to the code, we'll bring it back to the design, et cetera. We'll keep bouncing through there. Uh, this has worked out really well for us. Uh, again, trying to move away from the, the monolithic model of, you know, doing a long iteration cycle, Showing it to or you know pushing it live, showing it to users, finding out, oops, we need you know we made a mistake, we missed something along the, along the way, and we want to actually you know go change it, and again long iteration cycle. In this case, we're doing it really quick. We were even bordering on the point we were just talking about earlier, where every week we were doing iteration cycles with usability testing, and this was all actually on UI code. Um, there's this problem with that though, is that typically when teams go and they want to prototype uh, on you know larger scale stacks. They'll, they want something lightweight. They want some scripting language that they can go prototype on. And so they go build out uh, on you know, Django, Rails, whatever have you, and they'll build a prototype on that. Or they use static HTML. Depends on how far you want to get with it. Um, and so you build that out. You, you test it out. You get to a point where it works great. And then you have to go to production, and it's something else. And so again, something gets lost in translation. There's performance implications. Uh, something you did over on you know, the, product, or the prototype stack doesn't make it to the production stack. We really wanted to avoid this. <clears throat> and so, hey, got text trapping. Uh, and so uh, as part of this, this is part of, part of the incentive behind Dust was that you know, ignoring the application stack, since they're decoupled in this case, uh, to Dina's point, you know, you're talking JSON. So ignoring the application stack, if we're building out our UI in Dust, then there's no, nothing lost in translation, because whatever you have on your current prototype stack, you, it is your production stack, too. You just need to change the application that's sending the JSON. Um, and so that was one of the problems we were trying to solve, was you know, the, the idea of losing things in translation. Um, the other problem we were trying to solve, I alluded to it, was we have 10 plus years of code. So we have uh, uh, our newer code coming out, which is pure Dust and Node.js for the application. 
uh, we have our, our, the stack that a lot of our code is based on right now, which is Java and JSP. And then we have uh, the legacy stack that you know, PayPal's been around for on ever, or forever, which is C++ and XSL. And so you, know, you can't really iterate on JSP as easily as you can on Dust. You absolutely cannot iterate on XSL. Um, won't even go down there. Uh, so <clears throat> we really wanted to make this iteration capable across all these stacks. More importantly, uh, if you, you know, look through PayPal's history of times, you'll notice that the UI has been evolving but as time goes, we're actually at a point where we have old UI from all three stacks on, this, uh, on the site right now. And we really wanted to bring it home so we could actually have a single UI layer across all of our stacks. So how do we get there? And obviously the answer is dust. That's why we're all here. Um, so what we did about a year ago is we started with our, our, our ideal stack. You know, what would our ideal application stack be? And it actually ended up where it was you know, JavaScript templating. We ended up with dust and Node.js. <clears throat> and this is great for a couple of reasons. One was the iteration speed was really good. We started out with just a, you know, this would be our ideal mock stack where, you know, cool, it's JavaScript. So you can pretty much, you know, front end guys, they know JavaScript. So it's easy. You can go build an application. It works out well. Um, you get to a point then, or we got to a point where we started to question like, well, this is really good for a, uh, you know, our mock stack, but it actually, there's no reason why it couldn't be good for our production stack too. And so we started going down that path of making it our production stack as well. Uh, you get to a, Dust is interesting in this case, though. Um, you know, to Vina's point, Dust is renderable on the server, on the client, anywhere there's JavaScript. Uh, and so in our case, we have a slightly different model than LinkedIn has. We're, we have it up to the option of the application. Are they rendering it on the server? Are they rendering it on the client? There's cases where it's, uh, you know, good to have the choice. It's applicable where you don't really want uh, server side, or you don't really want server side rendered things. You want a more interactive experience or you don't care about an interactive experience. You just have a marketing page. You want to make it look like a marketing page. Um, and so we have that left up to our, uh, our developers, but it's given us a lot of flexibility because we can, uh, even in our client side cases, a lot of the times the fallback happens where it'll actually render server side anyway. Um, you know, if JavaScript's disabled, there's an ancient browser out there, IE6 even, um, or you know, just other various cases you might need to support. This actually, this is sort of the, the interesting find that happened, though, uh, that we weren't really expecting upon. Whereas, you know, cool, well, Dust renders anywhere there's JavaScript. So, you know, this ties in with our, prototype, our prototyping and speed has improved, but we still have 10 years of legacy code. Don't laugh at my diagram, it's awesome. Well, that was supposed to be smell originally, yeah. Um, this is my pile of trash. Uh, we still have 10 years of legacy code out there, and, you know, we can prototype really fast now, but we still have all this legacy code, and it's as much as we want to think, call it legacy, we're still maintaining it. We're still coding it. You guys are still using it. And so this is where we started to go, well, cool, Dust renders anywhere there's JavaScript. So uh, much like LinkedIn, you know, we started looking at our technology stack, and we said, cool, we have, we have Java, we have JSP. Well, you know, JSP is not bad for iteration speed, but it's not good. You can, get a, you can get all these cycles out, but you can really only get so many things cranked into the JSP code itself. And what we did is uh, we embedded Rhino in JSP, or in the Java stack. And we ultimately said, cool, well, Rhino works. We did some tests. Uh, Rhino was able to, you know, decent performance with it. So we, at that point, said, well, we don't need JSP. So we stopped using it. And everything's based on Dust at this point. And this is not the exact code we have. It's something I ended up writing later with, and I have Vina's link down. So, yeah. But, um, uh, you know, ultimately it's a case where you're in Java, you populate a model, and you just dust render. And you know, it, behind the scenes, it's actually using Rhino and executing all the JavaScript under the covers. And this gets to, gets to a really neat point, though, because, you know, cool, well, now we have this new and improved stack. We have Java, we have Dust, not JSP. But now the Dust code can actually be shared across Node.js and Java. So the same UI widgets that we're using on you know, the Node stack are the same UI widgets on the Java stack. And it allows us to keep a consistent experience across them. It also shortens the development time because, you know, you don't need to prototype out in the Java stack. You can go prototype out in the Node stack. You can prototype out in the clients. You can prototype anywhere there's JavaScript. So in that case, then we're in the process of doing a more interesting step where it's like, cool, we have a really large amount of code that's on our C++ stack. Uh, and it's C++ and XSL. And, you know, XSL, I have XSL iteration speed is poor. It's actually really impossible. So you could try to iterate all you want, but ultimately you're back in the stack or back in the mode where you need to go, 
okay, cool, now I'm going to write this in some other language and you know, to, to just test out the idea, and then I'm gonna transport it over to XSL. Um, so this is, you know, accounts for a large amount of our site at the moment. So we're actually going down the path of exploring V8 uh, for the JavaScript environment. Uh, in, in this mind, it would be, again, the same thing. Let's take XSL and get rid of it. Let's just use V8, or in Dust in this case. And so I, uh, to complement your link, I have my own link, um, you know, I, I went down just a little proof of concept to try this out, and it was actually really easy. So I wrote a Dust library for uh, V8, which ultimately, or for C++, which ultimately just binds to all the V8, now I'm mixing them up, all the Dust, Dust functions. And so directly from within C++, you can call render, you can call compile, uh, depending upon how familiar you are with the, super, with the dust code, it'll, when it, it misses a template in its cache, it'll actually load it directly through C++ code. Uh, it's seamless. And so, you know, it's the same thing. Populate your model, dust render. Uh, and so, again, the cool thing, these wrap pretty bad, is that, you know, if we get this in place, uh, we'll now have C++ and dust, and we'll, again, have the same UI code that's shared across uh, Node, C++, and Java. And that way, it'll really unify our stack. And more importantly, we won't need to uh, context shift when we think about it from a UI. Like, ultimately, if you're building an application and you're building a UI, nothing really matters. You know, if you're getting your data, you're getting your data. It doesn't matter where it came from. Uh, and that shouldn't be the case with UI, your UI. So now Dust is usable across all of our stacks. Um, it's sort of the epitome of, like, don't repeat yourself for your UI. You should not be building, you know, some UI con construct over on stack A and then having it again, over on stack B, because ultimately what happens is, you know, you build this spiffy looking thing over here, and then a year passes and you build a spiffier looking thing over here, and your users pun are, are sort of punished for it because they get this inconsistent experience. Um, <clears throat> and so, as I mentioned, the, the partials are shareable in this case. So when, I, when I'm talking about components, it ultimately boils down to partials or helpers that we're gonna be sharing between the dust code, and that's transposable across the stack. That makes it so that it's consistent for us but more importantly, our prototypes are in the same technology as production. And that allows us to ultimately you know, traverse everything just using dust. Uh, and so it makes it really quick and really efficient to get things done in our case because it's just dust. There's no real compile time notice. There's no you know, special logic or special handling you need to do with it. It's just a JavaScript file that at the end of the day, or a template file that at the end of the day gets turned into compiled JavaScript. And so that's where we stand with dust. Um, any questions? that point. <laughs> I understand that uh, uh, Rhino and V8 are used for server-side JavaScript rendering, mm -hmm. but can you tell me something about uh, uh, why you would choose one over the other? It seemed like you had some distinct cases where you would choose this one or that one. In Rhino or V8? Yes. So ultimately, it's the language you're in. So if it's Java, then Rhino is the accompanying uh, JavaScript runtime for it. Uh, whereas if it's C++, you would end up with V8. Okay. And I don't know if you have more. <laughs> consumer application that uh, runs a lot of our site. Uh, we really care about performance, and uh, we've done tests, and Rhino is a tad bit slower than V8. V8 is, again, um, easy to plug into C++. It's not easy to plug into Java because you need this JNI bridge you have to create and all that stuff. Um, so uh, for some use cases um, that are not highly, like emails is an offline case for us, right? Like, you know, you can um, um, send 200 emails per second with our current uh, infrastructure. That's decent enough for us. Uh, tomorrow, if we think that we need to send 5,000 emails per second, maybe we want to switch to doing that JNI bridge and invest time in it. Um, or cheaply, you can horizontally scale uh, for emails as well. It's not like an online experience. Sometimes that, you know, if your page is loading at 1.2 seconds or 1.5 seconds, it matters. Uh, but for web, it matters for us, and I think we chose to use V8. So. Uh, but because we are still on Java stack, and I don't know, most people might ask this question, you're on Java stack, and how do you put uh, this V8 for web? Um, pretty much a usual question I get, and I'll ask the question myself and then answer it. So um, uh, we heavily use something called Apache Traffic Server on the, on the front end layer, I don't know. Uh, coincidentally, we hired a lot of people from Yahoo, <laughs> so we have a lot of uh, Yahoo technologies that we also people came with. And Apache Traffic Server is like an equal enough, like a, you know, like a, the um, you know running an Nginx and stuff. Uh, 
um, in front of your thing. And you could write a lot of uh, plugins to it. And V8 is just another uh, plugin built into it. So every single traffic, uh, every single request that comes to LinkedIn.com goes through that box. So on the way out, uh, we actually uh, render some of our JSON into uh, using Dust into HTML and then and, 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 and send it back to the browser. Uh, so that's worked out really well for us because we didn't have to redo anything. We just put this 15 line code in uh, V8. Like, actually, it's basically 15 lines in what Woody said to actually write use V8 or Rhino in, in, in executing your DOS.js, it's 15 lines. So we put that and we run that in our Apache traffic server layer. Cool, thank you very much. Makes sense, yeah. If you have the luxury of using either or, I think you're being kind, V8's a lot faster than yeah. Rhino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't know how many people know about it, uh, Oracle is like really investing a lot and they've come up with something called Nashhorn, uh, which is a faster Rhino. Um, and I think as a company, uh, there are people in our team who are excited about, I mean, learning more and investing it. So if Rhino doesn't work out, we, we might actually use that in the, in the future. But it's still not a very stable release. So um, I think there are, there are companies that understand that, you know, they want to improve. So for the JVM stack, I think there's another alternative that you could explore. I think another thing to point out is... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we... call you out. <laughs> Or you can have this one too. <clears throat> Thanks, Bill. So another thing to point out, um, the reason. You want to introduce Rhino. yourself, Bill? Yeah, I'm Bill Scott. I'm <laughs> the person who's. Here's the picture up, up there. The yeah. uh, is is a bridging technology for us. We don't see long term that Java is our rendering engine, right? Node is where we're going. So to us, it was how do we get this big Java stack that's there? And how do we uh, <laughs> Trojan horse ourselves into using Node, right? The camel's nose under the tent. Because we felt Node was going to give us much more power. Of course, we tried out first, you know, from prototyping and mock-up, and it worked so well. We moved forward. In fact, today we, uh, two days ago, we had a situation where we've been building out an experience on the Node stack, you know, going this rapid iteration every two weeks, usability study, a lean UX approach. And the UI is all built out. And then we found out the services team had built uh, services for us and they were ready. And we were able just to, to you know, all this is in dust and node, right? And we were able to, with one day, just hook up the services and have a uh, full experience. Whereas on the Java stack, that would take weeks, right? So that's just, all this stuff's being motivated for us. How do we get to a rapid <coughs> experimentation? How do we get to where we have lots of experimentation and move really, really fast? Because we, PayPal has historically been extremely slow. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? So how many people are, uh, I just want to know, how many people here are from not LinkedIn and not PayPal? Wow. The majority. God, I need to go send a message to my LinkedIn folks. <laughs> uh, they hear me a lot on LinkedIn, so they probably didn't want to show up. Uh, so um, I know just as a feedback to uh, me, we shared um, our story. We shared why we chose it. Hopefully the message is not like we want you to like, we don't have a cult here that we want everyone to use yeah. Dust. <laughs> Seriously, uh, but I think the underlying goal for us was um, uh, what problems we face uh, as, as the company grows. Uh, you know, as we, we want to adopt new technologies, but as Bill was saying, it was, it's all about a seamless migration. It's a seamless way to help you move towards new things because we all are business and product driven. We want to ship our products and we don't think we can invest time in um, you know, just using some new shiny thing. Um, so I hope everyone else here um, have taken some bit from that. Okay. Uh, and we both are on uh, Git. We both are on um, Twitter. Um, um, anybody wants to come work for LinkedIn? <laughs> uh, pay PayPal. PayPal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody wants to come work for PayPal or LinkedIn? Because I saw a lot of hands raised that don't work for either. Um, um, do come talk to me. You know, sh send me an email. Yeah. Oh, sure, please. Yeah, yeah. Is it about, like, <laughs> when do I apply? Yeah, please apply right now. <laughs> so, um, we can, we can go the what, what one sort of unifying theme I was hearing regarding Dust is that you, you were sort of unifying this presentation layer, this, this, this V in the MVC, this, this templating across different stacks from Java, C++, and Node, and so forth. So is there something specific about, about Dust that made it easier to, to accomplish that? as opposed to any of these, these other JavaScript-based uh, templating frameworks. I'm curious what you say. Um, I would 
probably make the point that uh, from a capability perspective, any JavaScript-based templating language can support that. Yeah. Uh, they may not be able to do it out of the box at the moment, but it's you know at the end of the day, they're all JavaScript, uh, so they could have they have the potential to do it. I was hoping that Jeff would say he was so inspired by LinkedIn that he wanted to use Dust, <laughs> but uh, well, that was why we that was ultimately why we chose. Okay, Dust. that's I, the I mean, truth. You know, and it's an interesting point, uh, not entirely to your question. So hopefully, I've answered that, but. But uh, at least in our case, from PayPal's perspective, uh, part of the reason we actually chose Dust uh, was because you know we could blame it on them if it went wrong. Uh, now, uh, was that they were already going down the path, and it was it was really good to be able to partner with them yeah. and have uh, you know two companies that are working together to really take a framework and bring it to the next level for you know the large scale. Um, that you know, it's there's someone made the point earlier. I think that there's like twenty thousand JavaScript templating languages out there right now. There are, yeah. Literally, yeah. And, or is every alphabet letter, that's what it was. And, uh, the MVC and the templating language are competing yeah, with each other. Yeah. Uh, and so not all of them are equal uh, from performance standpoints or, or various other support level aspects. So actually having companies adopt it is a, sort of a big step in being able to walk down that path. Yeah, and, and I think to answer a little bit more, um, <clears throat> we um, chose something that we thought was um, kind of fit for us because it was extensible. It, it was mature, even though, I mean, when we saw initially that guy who did it had, had a great tool to play around, and I, I, we thought that commitment was amazing. We thought that guy would come join LinkedIn, actually, but <laughs> he just went missing. Um, so I think that it was pretty mature for, when we compared, we really did a comparison. We did a chart, we looked at it. If you look at all the features, we wrote about it in the blog post. Some things were very important for us, able to extend, make it, you know, extend it, put it on the server and the client. Um, a lot of the others were like to-dos on it. <laughs> Literally, they did the basic part, and everything else was a to-do. Um, I mean, you, you could you could write one actually in uh, in probably in a day, but have like ten percent of the stuff working. Uh, so there are a lot of out there in GitHub like that. Um, but the main competitors was Handlebars and, and Mustache. Uh, Mustache was too limiting for us because performance is not really great with it. We have seen, and it's very very limiting on how much stuff you can extend from it. Uh, and there are like. 10 or, I don't know, maybe 30 different implementations of Mustache because it is written in Java to Python to PHP, but our whole goal was actually not do that, but keep it to JavaScript because our idea was keep it to JavaScript, right? Uh, you could write some extensions. We have built like some of the extensions to uh, using the peg grammar that Dust comes with. It's, a, it's, a, it's open source grammar. You can read the grammar and implement it in Java. You can implement it in Scala. You can write something, but the goal was to keep all our uh, templates uh, rendered in the client to unify this experience. So that was one of the, um, and I think main, main other reasons we chose Dust. Um, maybe we're a little biased about it, <laughs> but uh, it, it's, not a, it's not a big deal to switch from handlebars to Dust as I've seen. Because handlebars is another great backing from uh, you know Yehuda Katz because he did a he's, he's a great developer he's amazing um, and he has uh, supported it a lot some companies use it um, recently Twitter was trying to use uh, some of Mustache and it said it did not want to uh, some people wrote back to us when uh, I don't know how many read the Twitter post about it moving back to server side and not using client rendering and things like that um, but I've clarified many times and our and our team wanted to dig deep and we went met with them. Um, and their use case is different, right? I mean, they have a single Twitter page. Uh, all they do is kind of tweets and search through tweets. Search is their big thing. Um, and they want very, a lot of instant stuff. And they do use a lot of MBC and, and, and Hashbang. I don't know how many people have done that with that thing, Hashbang routing. That was costing them a lot. Uh, basically, you know, you're spending a lot of time uh, doing that on the browser, and not all browsers across the geography was good. So they did some tests and then figured out, and, some remote geographical locations, their performance was bad, and you're, you couldn't make much money. Um, so for us, as I said, profile is using it, 100% ramped. Uh, everybody's profile across all over the globe. It's like a huge product for us, like the uh, profile. If we had not made that step, we would probably have backed out. Uh, so um, and we continue to, I mean, as I said, every use case is different. So you come in for a talk like this, and you, you get the best you think you want, and then you have to go try it out. Unless you try it out, like PayPal did, I don't think there was an answer for them. So uh, that's, that's how you choose something. I think you have to try it out. Unless you try it out, you won't get the answer. So answer your question about Dust. It was just a coincidence, probably. Yeah, yeah, you could. You can, yeah, you can build a lot of these modules, as I think Jeff was saying. Their UI is pretty consistent now because um, they can build that and reuse a full module, I mean, across. So that gives you an iteration speed. It gives you a 
common look and feel across LinkedIn. Um, if you build it in different stacks and different templating languages, you, it's easy for you to lose that common thing. Um, because you want your button to look the same way, you want your, like, you know, your uh, 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 list of items to look the same way, that helps you achieve that unification. And it's good for eyes when somebody is like browsing through a LinkedIn profile and jumps to a search page, and then from search page they go to look at someone's profile and they start browsing profiles. That keeps them engaged. Um, there's a lot of studies done on that, so maybe that's one benefit too. Does that answer your question? Maybe I spoke too much. <laughs> Uh, so I'm glad you mentioned the Twitter thing, moving back to the server. Are you guys in the Twitter group? Are you from Twitter? No? Okay. No. Um, uh, I thought I might mean, I mean, you would just come and no, have a fight or something. Just go a little bit further that way. And you did mention that you also do render on the server for older browsers. But uh, do you specifically just say, uh, is it sort of linear that IE6 will get that treatment? Or are there more factors? How do you determine? what should get rendered on the server, if it's for the web, not email, not SEO related stuff. So. Um, I can take the question. So something that's probably not very obvious to many people is like when you say client side rendering, right? You have a skeleton that we always render on the server because a browser doesn't understand <laughs> JSON. Browser does not understand uh, anything, I mean, I mean, I mean, HTML, like the skeleton HTML still have to be given back to the browser first. So that skeleton, which is a very bare bone piece, is always rendered on the server. Um, so that's something I wanted to note. Uh, so we use uh, V8 for that, as I said. That's one of the reasons we chose V8, because every single request that's using Dust at this point of time has its skeleton rendered on the server. And then we kind of have these you know, bits and pieces of the page, like the modules we call, that are rendered on the client. Um, how many people here are familiar with Facebook's big pipe um, uh, aspect, right? Uh, if you're a very uh, UI junkie, you would have followed it. It came, it came pretty, you know, almost three years back, Facebook started using it. So they have a very graceful way of like showing their uh, newsfeed and stuff. So your newsfeed pops up and then you have stuff on the right pop up and things like that. So they don't render your entire page immediately. Um, so they uh, render the skeleton and fill in blocks of your uh, UI as and when they come. LinkedIn also has a similar problem because in profile, that amount of time spent on assembling all that data is like, 600, 700 milliseconds. But for engagement, we want to show about the full stuff immediately. So what we do is kind of uh, send the skeleton back, render on the server, and then start pushing in uh, about the full modules immediately and render the uh, stuff below the folds later. So we have control on doing that thing. So that's one of the uh, things I was saying. Server-side rendering is not just for emails or SEO. We do use uh, server-side rendering. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, when do we choose uh, to do server-side rendering? It's a very use case specific thing. Um, one thing I can say is there are certain payments pages. Um, I know PayPal uh, is all about payments. We do have payments because we have subscriptions and stuff in LinkedIn. Um, that's something that says that, you know, uh, that team might come back and say, uh, you know, for security reasons and things, I really don't want to render anything on the client. Um, so we, based on our use case basis, we do it. Again, that's configurable uh, per, uh, per your, in, in, in your routing, whether you want this routed via that uh, proxy that I was talking of, or you go all the way to the browser and render everything. So um, we try to do less on the server and more on the client. I think Twitter's approach to compare was to try to move everything back to the server. And very little like Ajax stuff it's done on the client is what I've heard. Um, and the reason they gave when we went and met with them is basically the metrics seemed far better. And the same reason the metrics are for us are as good as they had to be for client, we've kept with client rendering. I think the flexibility offered by uh Dust in general is actually what you know is one of the beneficial things about it. You have the flexibility to say server, client, as a holistic level, or even somewhere in between. Yeah. And it's finding what in, what in between actually works for you. That's really the, the important part. So I mean, there's no golden rule about it. I guess you can run A/B tests and see, and based on that, decide what you want to. We we do that for lots of profile pages. For certain people, we run a complete rendering on the profile uh, on the server. For certain users, we are running client. <coughs> For certain users, we actually render only below the fold on the, on, on the client and above the fold on the server. Um, so we, we can run a lot of those experiments um, because we, uh, we, we, we split that whole profile page into things that can be easily A-B tested that way. So um, that helps us understand what metrics you know, change. I mean, we're talking of engagement metrics and site speed metrics, right? So we can control doing that uh, uh, using the system. So imagine if all of this was written in JSP, right? There's no way for you to even do these kind of experiments. Um, or if it's written all in ERBs, there's no way for you to do these kind of experiments. You have to render the entire page no matter what. Um, that's, that's the beauty of using um, client templating, I think. So Dust is just one of them. Uh, there are many, and uh, I think our 
goal here, I think at the uh, end of the day, is not to like really say <laughs> dust is the best, <laughs> but it's work. And, and we both collaborate a lot, and some people here have like worked together, so that helps us. Having a community helps us. Yep. That's it. Cool. Hey. You want? So in our case, actually, what uh, the question was: How do you implement something like, <laughs> excuse me, a component or a widget in Dust? Uh, one of the ways we've gone about doing that is sort of redefining what a component was. Um, and let me know if I'm answering your question exactly. Uh, you know, historically, we would have uh, very concrete implementations of a component. Uh, you know, this is the exact markup for a button, for instance. And you know, you bring that over, and there would be CSS or JavaScript associated with it. Um, that was, it was good and bad. Uh, it, it standardized on everything you needed, but it made your HTML look like not HTML. Uh, so you'd have partials everywhere. Uh, so what we're doing now is actually making it more, uh, uh, we're influenced heavily, let's say, by uh, Bootstrap from Twitter. And so we're making it more where a lot of the components themselves are actually uh, snippets of code. And then they're coming through with you know, their CSS or JavaScript associated with them as well. The dust partial is playing in this case because there's certain constructs that, um, and I think the example that always comes to my mind is our address uh, entry widget. So it supports, uh, Stephen, help me out. I'm going to go with. 25 plus combinations of you know inputs and various yeah different country locales and things but inputs all over the place different support uh, that's not ever something you would want like a snippet of copy and paste because it's you know crazy so what we have is the equivalent of uh, in line with uh, Bootstrap we're actually using Bower as well for component deployment so you can we can basically just Bower clone down the uh, the address component. And it'll give us any associated less files or any associated JavaScript files that are then linked into the application. But also, uh, on some of them, like address, you'll get the uh, you know, address widget dot dust. Uh, and it has ultimately, it's, it's ultimately, in, our, in this case, using uh, uh, dust's uh, inline, or not inline, variableized in, or parameters, partials. And like, it'll come to me eventually, um, where you know, it's the partial includes is dynamic. So you include address input, and then it figures out, based on the data coming through, what uh, locale you're in, and it'll actually grab the correct impar or partial and include that as well. Um, but this is all you know, a component that gets deployed, gets copied down. You get you know, the dust partials along with it. So if they ever get upgraded or changed, you inherit that as well. Uh, and then you just link those into your page. So where you going? Okay. Um, and so rather than having uh, dust representations for every single component that we have, uh, like a button, you know, buttons are just buttons. Uh, but more complex things that are represented in dust are represented in dust. Any last questions? Okay. Thank you, guys. Yeah.